I think it's, I think we are live, hopefully. <laughs> hey everyone. <laughs> this is my first time live streaming and I hope everyone can see us, but welcome. Ah, it is working. <laughs> it starts out awesome. with you laughing. Woo! All right. All right, so welcome to another episode of Grad Chat, where we create a space to discuss topics in grad school ranging from mental health, professional development, diversity and inclusion, and so much more that may not be as easy to discuss in person. My name is Faye Lynn, and I'm going to send it over to my co-host, Susanna. Hey, everybody. I'm Susanna Harris, and uh, as per usual, super excited to talk to our guest of the day. Um, our guest today is Crystal, who is a PhD candidate in astro atmospheric chemistry. Hey, you gave me this job, and now I get to mess it up uh, at Caltech. <laughs> and uh, so due to a genetic condition, Crystal's health took a turn for the worse during her third year of grad school. And this kind of stark difference between experiences before and after identifying as, a, uh, as disabled, uh, Crystal has started to advocate for increased accessibility in academia, particularly in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And um, she's going to do a much better job of explaining what all of these things are, but super excited to have you on, Crystal. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't know. Thank happy you. to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. We've been we've been looking forward to this for a while. I think we had you scheduled for a very long time. So um, we're going to jump into questions from different people on Instagram, Twitter. Um, anyone who's watching now, feel free to drop your questions as well. But first, I would love to learn more about the sentence that I messed up, which is what what do you study in atmospheric chemistry? Yeah, so atmospheric chemistry, in my case, is a fancy way of just saying that I think a lot about air quality, um, which as someone living in LA, uh, it's very obvious that we have really poor air quality here, especially when you consider like the California fires. Um, what I look at in particular is I study what happens to our air quality when urban pollution from factories, cars, whatever, um, interact and move towards more um, natural vegetation areas. Um, so trees emit their own compounds and they mix together with our urban pollution and then they create a, um, aerosols or ozone, both of which um, contribute to smog. So I study a lot of that. I also have done um, some work on wildfire emissions, um, which I can talk a little bit about fieldwork later, but uh, the fieldwork I've participated in, you go on um, this gutted out plane that you put a bunch of um, uh, words uh, scientific instruments in and then you fly around uh, like the fire wildfire plumes and then you sample it and you can Jeez. try and assess some of the chemistry that happens and how certain compounds form in there Oof. yes <laughs> that's wild that's very like topically relevant as well so right and you're you're at caltech which is did you experience much of the i don't know bad air what do we call this smog yeah, so um, the mountain right above our school definitely got um, some fire action. Uh, we have an observatory out there called Mount Wilson and um, they were like, you can see from the cameras that some of the flames got really close, but luckily everything's okay and everyone's okay. Um, there were evacuation orders, maybe a couple miles like Northeast of the campus, but it never really affected like the immediate area. That's cool. Are you originally from California? Like, how did you get into atmospheric chemistry? Did, I don't know, the fires now like play a part in that? <laughs> or what sparked that interest? It was completely by accident. I just took a class um, because I needed units for financial aid and it happened to be intro to environmental science. And one like unit of that was atmospheric uh, science and air quality. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm a chemistry major and I didn't know you could apply chemistry to like environmental things and questions. And so I kind of just went from there and started looking at different research opportunities and eventually took an actual course and fell in love basically. <laughs> that's so cool. Okay, we should switch over to all these questions. People send in so many questions like Linda, our social media handler, 
uh, was like, we're just going to have to ask you to do like a stories at some point because there's so many questions, which is amazing, which clearly means that this needs to be talked about more. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So why don't we jump in? Uh, today's topic is becoming disabled in grad school. And like Susanna said, we got a wealth of questions that were submitted on social media. So the first one we have here says, what were the main differences you noticed between navigating grad school as someone who was seemingly able-bodied and as someone who is disabled? Yeah, so, I mean, grad school is difficult for everyone. Um, but when I became disabled, I just noticed that kind of that um, toxic academic, like you have to work all the time, um, you should be in lab all the time, like those kind of mentalities just kind of aggravated and like blew up in my face because I can't physically do that all the time. Um, I have a lot of fatigue issues. I, I do a lot of my best work at home um, because I, I can save energy on commuting. Um, but that expectation that like you should be at your office doing work like for all hours of the day, it's just, it's pretty detrimental. Um, also in general, um, lab spaces, cause I'm in STEM, those are pretty inaccessible. Um, so even though my skill set didn't change at all, uh, I found doing experiments became a lot more difficult. It's hard to navigate the lab if you have a mobility aid cause um, my lab in particular is not set up for that. And I can't use a wheelchair um, in my lab. Um, and then just like things you wouldn't think about, like sometimes the safety showers are hard to reach if you're like in a sitting position, um, like in a wheelchair or the humming noises in the background can be really, um, can induce migraines or be inappropriate for people who have noise sensitivities, which I have. So there's just a lot of contributing factors where I'm like nothing really changed except for my health declining a bit, but I still face, it, face so many like different issues that I wasn't expecting. I think that answered the question. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, and, and I think you were gonna bring up too at some point with the, um, the idea of field work. But one thing I wanted to ask really quickly is, is you know, in our description, it says something about um, a genetic situation. This was like the third year of grad school. Could you tell us a little bit more about just kind of what happened? Yeah, so I have this condition called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a mouthful, but HEDS is, is enough. Um, I know like three people with that. Sorry, that's like a really weird thing to get excited about, but I'm like, oh, I know things about this. Keep going, please. No, it's okay. I get excited when I know people with it because <laughs> I don't know, like we all find each other somehow, um, but it's essentially a connective tissue disorder. Um, so connective tissue is all over your body and it's a structural component. I'm not a biologist, so. I'm sorry if I get anything wrong, but um, yeah, it's supposed to be a structural rigid like type of tissue and mine's just kind of floppy, um, which means that like my joints are kind of unstable and move in weird ways. And like, um, I have trouble standing because my blood vessels don't always work the right way. So I get really um, tachycardic um, and it can affect other things. I, everyone with EDS is different. So I'm just speaking from my experience, but um, yeah. Uh, nervous system issues. Some people have immune system issues. It's it's a whole wild, wild world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, from the people that I know, it is, it is something that kind of comes on, right? Like this isn't something, I don't, I don't know, like how, do, how did this come out in your third year of grad school versus? Yeah. You know? So I don't know. I, I've always been um, hypermobile. Uh, my joints have always been a little flexible, but um or I guess flexible is the wrong word. Hypermobile, so hypermobile and flexibility are different things and we, we don't have to get into that. But um, yeah, I've always had signs of having uh, some form of hypermobility, but it was relatively benign. Um, I've had a couple instances in college where like I was running for a 5K and then my hip misaligned, which is like a big sign that something's wrong, but no one was like, oh, something's wrong. Um, I don't know why my third year of grad school, everything went downhill um, in terms of that. Uh, I would, I would argue that maybe it's induced by stress. Like you can have different, um, chronic illness comes about in different ways. It can be stress induced. It can be induced by like having a virus. Um, you just never really know, I guess. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And one question we got was, has your disability changed the way you saw your career going? Um, yes, more 
well, it's kind of directly and indirectly. So directly, um, I feel like I'm kind of a bit more limited on where I look for jobs. Uh, my whole medical team is in Southern California. And so switching jobs and thinking about the headache of insurance in the US and uh, will I find specialists in wherever else I have to go? Um, that kind of limits my options right now, in my opinion. Indirectly, um, for full disclosure, I probably won't uh, be in science after I graduate. So I'll leave scientific research. Um, but that's more of the fact that like just having to deal with all these like self-advocacy things um, seems like too big of a headache for something that like I can be happier elsewhere, in my opinion, and not have to fight as hard. <laughs> yes, I love that. Yeah, and I think, so we always have our guests do an Instagram takeover before a grad chat on Saturday. So the takeover is on Friday. And I think, I remember one of the things that you said that resonated with me was when you do become disabled during grad school, and then it's very new to figure out what exactly your needs are, or how to manage, manage what it means to become disabled and then running into thing issues with the system where they also aren't as prepared to support you and how frustrating that can be when it's a learning curve for you to understand what's happening and then on the system end they're not there to support and just how how frustrating that can be and how much we can really improve on that situation mm -hmm. was really insightful I think or a really important thing to keep in mind in this discussion and with that another question we had submitted on social media says how do you deal with faculty who have a narrow mind of disability I had a professor say that I'm quote technically not disabled is it my job to educate them um it's never your job to educate if you don't want to that's my one piece of advice um it's hard enough dealing with these kind of situations, I think it's inappropriate to expect to have to educate everyone. Um, they have Google, they can figure it out. They have um, the accessibility resources or disability resources at your school, they can ask them. Um, I haven't come across faculty like that, but I did become disabled after I took all of my classes. So I didn't have to really deal with it in a classroom setting, but I do know people who have um, most universities allow you to file a grievance um, of some sort if they refuse accommodations. Um, but I also understand that that takes a lot of time and energy and doesn't always resolve everything. And then you still have to go to class with this person who like knows you're filing this grievance. So it's this whole big power dynamic thing. Um, all I can say is I'm really sorry that happened and hopefully uh, you can get the support you need. Um, there's the plane over in my place. Hello. Um, thanks. Uh, there's also, I know that this sucks, uh, but there's no shame in dropping the class and trying to take it with another professor if that's possible. Um, I wish I could offer more advice, but <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's great. And, and the point of like self ad, like advocating for yourself in whatever way that means, like not teaching somebody if that's not something that you want or, or can do, um, that it's actually a form of self-advocacy if you just stand up for what you can do and what you need. Um, one question is, is there a number one thing that would make your life easier in the lab? Um, so this is very me specific because <laughs> of my own thing, but um, I really like ergonomic chairs uh, so we have like high counter spaces and a high fume hoods, which I think most labs do. Um, and we have better than those like really crappy wooden stools that they give you in chemistry labs, but um, they're not that much better because <laughs> like the back's a bit low. And so like, it's hard to, um, I don't know. I have back pain at the end of the day if I have to like be at these workspaces for a long period of time. Um, I also just want a couch or some place where I can lay down a cot um, because if I'm in between like time points, then I can just chill and no one really thinks twice about it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's uh, from, from other folks that I know who have that um, or have this condition, they, it's basically, they've told me that it's very difficult to sit for a long time, stand for a long time, do any like 
certain position for a very long time. Do you find some similar things? Yeah, so um, I definitely laid down a lot. I think a lot of my Instagram live was, uh, or my Instagram stories yesterday was in my bed. Um, so I love it. It's, it's my real life. Um, yeah, sitting for long periods of time in chairs that are uncomfortable, uh, I'm gonna ache at the end of the day. Standing, um, it just gets me really tired really quickly. Uh, so my day is basically done if I have to stand for like more than an hour because then I just need to go lay down. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And with that said, I think a lot of people submitted questions where they're interested in learning more about accommodations and how to go about that, especially when it comes to being grad student in the lab. So one of the questions here says, how did you go around ensuring you got lab or field accommodations what was the feedback from the uni or advisor like? So at Caltech, I didn't really feel like their accessibility resources center was equipped to handle me, which makes no sense either because they are mostly a graduate institution that deals with science, um, but they don't have a full-time accessibility specialist. So the, the deans who are in charge are not fully trained and they're trying their best, but you know, um, so most of the accommodations that I ended up uh, having were talked with directly with my PI. And I want to point out that I'm really, really thankful that my PI was understanding. Um, a lot of PIs aren't, and I can understand why you don't want to disclose um, at all, but that's just how I went about it. Um, and I don't know, let's see, what else? Uh, I also just took things into my own hands. So I was like, I'm just going to use a cane and we'll figure out all the safety stuff on my own and make sure that I don't contaminate it with chemicals or something. Or I'm just going to say like, hey, advisor dude, I'm going to just work from home. Um, I'm working. You can, uh, you can, I don't know, email me if you want an update, but like, it's fine. But again, I'm in a supportive lab uh, in the long run. And so I think I just lucked out in that way. Yeah. This actually ties really well into our next question, which is what piece of advice would you give to PIs or advisors who want to support disabled students better, but don't know where to start? Um, communication, talking to them. You don't, obviously you don't, um, you're not entitled to any medical information. I'm just gonna put that out there. But just like a general, like, what do you need to succeed? Like, do you need any specific accommodations? Um, knowing where the disability services office is, being able to direct students um, and I don't know, just showing that you care. I think that if you show that you're willing to talk about these things and show that you're willing to learn that your students will be more comfortable talking to you about anything, not just disability, um, also mental health and also like other issues surrounding um, racism and sexism, sexism in academia. So just be, be a nice person. <laughs> that's my, that's my <laughs> advice. <laughs> no, I think I think that is just so important to keep in mind where bringing about a open dialogue, a very welcoming attitude can go a long way when someone might, uh, given all the barriers in place, it still might be hard to come up to your advisor and advocate for yourself and just opening that door and being a nice person <laughs> is one of the best foundational first steps to do. So I think that that is definitely very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. So our next question here says, how do you navigate around taking sick days with flares? Um, again, really supportive lab environment that isn't super picky about me having to be there all the time. I mean, there is this expectation that is there. Um, but I think I've built up a rapport with my advisor where he, he trusts me. Um, so I just take days off. If I have a meeting, um, most people who I talk to on a daily basis know that if I cancel last minute, it's because um, I'm not feeling well. Um, but also lab mates, A plus, uh, friends, A plus. I got really lucky about that. But I think just being open, being like, hey, if I cancel, um, it's probably because it, there's a good reason. Uh, don't think any less of me here. If you wanna set up like a Zoom meeting, I can join. Um, now without my camera on. I've done that before where I've zoomed from my bed, but I just kept my camera off so no one can see um, my disheveled form, um, which also ties in really nicely to like, things are so much easier for me right now because of all these Zoom meetings. Um, 
I haven't really had to cancel anything because of a flare lately because I can usually just pop in and not say much but still get the information that I need. I don't know. It's just a really interesting contrast to earlier on when everything was in person. Yeah, that's so yeah, that's so cool. And relatedly, I actually have to hop off, but um, yeah, it is. I I do want to thank you before Faye will keep going. Um, but uh, I want to thank you personally for for coming on and talking, and also being like such an inspiration and someone I've learned from so much on Twitter. Um, so I'm jumping off, but I'm going to get back in contact with you soon. Um, Faye, keep being amazing. Right, All right, Crystal. So we, like we said, we have so many questions here and I guess we'll just keep, keep going through because people are interested in so many diverse aspects of becoming disabled in grad school. And this one says, what were some support systems would you have liked to see during this transition period? Um, so most of those are from my university itself. So I would have liked to have known how to uh, register with the accessibilities office. Um, I feel like it took a lot of like searching on the school websites to figure out the process. Um, so having it advertised to students in general, like not just your disabled students would have been great. Um, having a, a disability service center that knew which accommodations to offer me or had a list somewhere or had like experience dealing with this would have been great. Um, and just having people be understanding, um, asking me what I need, um, being aware that there's some things I can't do. Um, so I have this really great friend who she just automatically walks to the elevator with me, um, which I think is great because I'm just like, oh, cool. I don't feel this expectation of like having to go up the stairs or I don't feel like I'm lazy or anything like that. Um, or I have this other, uh, great lab mate who, is like, oh, you don't seem like you're feeling that well, so I'll take over a little bit now. And then, you know, if the, the situations are switched and I don't feel well one day, then you can help me out. And I'm like, cool. So yeah, those kind of support systems, just being understanding um, and then having the uh, structure, resources and guidelines um, equipped into the university and readily available to your students. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great, what I'm hearing a great theme is other people taking initiative to help out if it's like walking into the elevator. And also we talk a lot about this idea of educating yourself and making those resources available because it is a lot of work to first undergo maybe this transition of becoming disabled, learning what that is. And just people taking initiative to support, I think is such a great great message to keep in mind. Right, I definitely wouldn't be where I am without the support system I had with friends and coworkers and whatnot. Um, like I said, like 500 times already, I was really lucky to, to have certain people in my life. Even with everything that uh, went wrong and all the stuff I had to fight for, I think that just having people there and being like, yeah, this sucks. Or like, yeah, I can see how this is wrong. And uh, what do you want me to do? I think that's, that's what I needed. Yeah, people are so important. Support networks are so important, for sure. And this next question kind of ties into how to find a support network. And it says, what would you recommend disabled people ask prospective advisors to ensure that they find the best situation? Ooh, um, that is a question. Um, maybe ask about their these are good questions for anyone, but like their work-life balance, their opportunity to work, um, if you prefer to work remote, how willing are they to do that? Um, what do they think about sick days, vacation hours, um, time off? Um, talk to their grad students, like even if none of their grad students are disabled, just knowing how comfortable they are going through their PI about things is a big, um, it's a red flag if they're not willing to talk to PIs about certain things like this. Um, what else? I guess maybe asking like the different, like how the diversity of the lab has changed over time. Um, most people are pretty uh, scared to disclose anything about disability because of how medicalized it is, but you can kind of get uh, your answers to some of these questions by like hinting around it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think in previous grad chats, we've also talked about how a lot of like nonverbal cues or maybe things that they're not willing to answer or uneasy about can also give you a lot of information about if this is going to be a comfortable environment for me. Right. I would also, just because I just thought about it, um, talk about the expectation to graduation. Sometimes things take longer. Um, sometimes if you have a certain condition and you just want to streamline it as fast as possible, like just they're willing to be flexible with, with what you're capable of, I think. Ask questions that hint at that. <laughs> yeah, and that actually leads really well into our next question, which says, how do you deal with advisor expectations of what you can and can't do work hour wise? Mm, <laughs> I think I'm just really blunt with my advisor, but um, yeah, I would just be open about it. Be like, these are my needs. Um, if it helps, sometimes registering with the disability service office, even if you don't get accommodations, is useful because then you have it written somewhere that like, okay, I am disabled and I have these needs and my advisor like can't go against this office who is supposed to be on my side. I guess is what I'm saying. So I registered with my disability service office in the off chance that um, someone being my advisor and my committee were like, no, you can't do X. And I'm like, yes, but I have this documented that I do need X or Y. Um, so uh, I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's, yeah, it's super important. A lot of these questions are getting at are how to interact with an advisor in these difficult discussions, especially given power dynamics and all the bureaucracy that you're also hinting at that comes with being supported in the lab. Yeah, so it's, it, it's so hard because every advisor is different. Um, and some are just more willing to have these conversations, even if they're like not necessarily the greatest person or greatest empathizer. Um, even if they're just willing to have these discussions, it's like a good step in the right direction. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. And I think it also speaks to how important it might be to test the waters before you end up making decisions on what environment is good for you and themes of finding a support network and just really transparent communication, how to really put those things together to make the best situation for yourself, which again, can be frustrating, but it sounds like there are tools out there to definitely navigate and great people out there that hopefully will definitely be there to support you. Right. Right. So let's see. Our next question says, how did you deal mentally with a diagnosis or reduced mobility? Did you have to change your approach to lab work? Um. Mentally, it was difficult. Um, I was luckily already in therapy. I deal with anxiety, depression, and I have for quite a while. Um, also, luckily, and this was completely a coincidence, my therapist happens to also be uh, chronically ill. So um, she was able to guide me a lot with trying to figure out my identity and like my, um, my new limitations in that kind of way. Um, my approach to lab work didn't change that much, but I think it was a lot of internalized ableism of like, I have to do it these, this way and I shouldn't like adapt. Um, so I definitely did push myself a lot um, when I was still doing lab work right now. I'm, I'm in dissertation mode, but um, like skipping lunches or like being like, okay, I have to finish this experiment. And then the next day I was just completely like wiped out. Um, so yeah, maybe not the best person to answer this. Uh, don't do what I did. <laughs> Listen to your body. <laughs> yeah, and I think you bring up this great point of there's societal pressure or there's still rampant ableism that maybe twists our thinking as well to not prioritizing ourselves when we absolutely should feel completely comfortable and say that I'm important, I need to prioritize myself despite all of these toxic messages in our environment. But that that is such a huge component, like societal just ableism and how to deal with a system that isn't as supportive for needs. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So you mentioned that you're currently in your dissertation period and this next 
a question someone asks is what are some current challenges you're facing as someone who will soon graduate and transition into the workforce uh, and also has becoming disabled impacted your career, which you've somewhat talked about as well in the beginning of our chat. Yeah. Um, I would say that Mar cause I'm, I'm kind of in the looking at job applications and like, I don't know, applying to a couple to test the waters, but they always ask like, are you disabled or are you a person with disability um, in the job app and clicking that box is terrifying in a way. Um, a lot of, like there's a lot of discrimination against disabled people when it comes to, to getting jobs. Um, we're underemployed or unemployed in great numbers. Um, so I don't, yeah, it's, it's terrifying to know that if I don't disclose, but then I say I need accommodations, they'll be like, well, why didn't you tell me before? And if I do disclose, then I'm wondering, does me checking that box mean that my application goes into the to the trash um, immediately, which it might, they're technically not legally able to, but like, that's really hard to prove. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's something I think about a lot. And um, it's kind of unfortunate that I have to think about it. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think it's a really frustrating. It's a really frustrating thing that you have to think about that you that's unfair that you shouldn't have to think about why would the checking this box put my application in the trash it's just completely you know even legally it's not something that people can do but you still have to worry about it which is the most frustrating thing and part of hopefully part of the reasons that we or or bring up these discussions to light hopefully will be part of the fight in changing those things but shedding light into some of these <laughs> issues is, it's still frustrating while we're in these broken systems, ultimately. Right, yeah. Sure. Let's see, we are, let's see, we are wrapping up our grad chat, but one of our last questions that we have here says, what are some challenges you face as someone who is considered to have a quote, invisible disability? Yeah, so I guess that also ties in with the job application question, but, um people look at me and they don't necessarily believe anything is quote unquote wrong with me um, or don't believe I have like um, like needs that maybe like a able-bodied person ha doesn't have. I don't know, that sentence didn't make sense. But essentially like, um, unless I have like a brace or I have like a, um, a cane or a wheelchair, people think that I'm able-bodied and that assumption then gets weird because when I'm like, I can't do, like, I can't lift a 10 pound box because of, for certain reasons, then they're like, well, why not? Like, are you just being lazy about it? Or like, what's the problem? Or like, I can't necessarily work 40 hours this week because I'm in a flare. And they're like, oh, she's probably just like using it as an excuse or she's lazy. Um, which is also not to say that people with visible disabilities have it any better or worse. It's just different, in my opinion. Um, that said, I think that, um, I don't know, I also have the benefit of like, quote unquote, passing. Um, so if I, if I never have to disclose, like if I'm just going to be at a place for like a couple hours and then never see them again, I don't have to really talk about it and then that, that removes some of the discrimination. So yeah, it's really, it's, it's a really odd dynamic here. <laughs> yeah, and I know that in talking a lot about the so-called idea of like an invisible disability in the sense of, uh, I talk a lot about mental health, depression and my experiences with that. And I relate a lot to what you said about people not believing you because mm -hmm. you just don't have a, a brace or any sort of visible aspect that would so-called prove that you're struggling. And that is a really frustrating thing to deal with where while you are struggling, the last thing you wanna do is to prove to other people that it's real. It's one of the most frustrating aspects, but you know, you also bring up this other idea of what, how passing as able-bodied can also bring up an interesting aspect to that dynamic as well. So it is complicated, but it's, it's great to have open discussions and hopefully 
with these ideas brought up, I think one of the main messages is for people to just be open-minded and listen to people who are experiencing these things and not to make assumptions and judgments. Yeah, and I think that applies to everyone, regardless of disability status, like just being more open to listening about their needs, even able-bodied people have needs, like sometimes they're just tired and they need to sit down, or they've been standing exactly. for like, I don't know, eight hours at their job, and then they're like, I, I, let's move this conversation to a table or something, I don't know. I, I always think that it's always good to, especially like, I guess, back to the PI question, to always broach the question of like, what do you need to succeed? Or what do you need to be successful in your role? Or what do you need at this time? Since I see that you're struggling a bit, like, uh, don't assume that they're doing it because uh, out of spite or because they're lazy. Um, just assume that maybe they need some help and offer that help. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a great note to wrap up on because we are out of time for this week's grad chat. But Crystal, if there's any other things that you want to bring up that we haven't talked about or any concluding remarks that you want to make. Um, let's see, concluding remarks. Oh, so much pressure. Um, my usual thing is disability is part of diversity. I think it's lacking in the diversity and inclusion space. Um, and I think that needs to change. Uh, being wary of when you're putting on events to make sure that you think about some of like the, the bare minimum basic things like, um, I don't know, putting uh, image descriptions on your posts on social media, those kind of things. Um, I think that would, that helps a lot for people. Yeah. I don't know. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, Crystal. It Thank was you. great having you. And I think a lot of these points are going to help so many people who are thinking about these issues, if they're looking to support or if they're looking to get support, I think it, it really helps to hear from different people and their experiences. So this has been Grad Chat from PhD Balance. And if you liked what you saw today, we go live every Saturday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. And we talk about all topics that might be a bit harder to talk about in real life. So this has been our topic, Becoming Disabled in Grad School with Crystal Vasquez. And if you like what you saw, come join us next week. So bye everyone. Bye.